the lost story about Brennan that I hope this book captures um, is is that Brennan was a great intellect, um, a, a really brilliant, capable man, um, and the world didn't see him that way for a couple of different reasons. I mean, one is that he was surrounded by um, figures that that were legendarily intellectual giants. Um, Felix Frankfurter, John Harlan, uh, Hugo Black, William O. Douglas, the world saw these men as, as, you know, just towering intellects. And Brennan was, you know, eh, Bill Brennan, some lawyer from New Jersey. So it was a long time. It was well after the end of the Warren Court uh, before people began to see that it was Brennan who was figuring out how to take this piece of the Fourth Amendment and make it apply to the states, or this piece of the, the Sixth Amendment and make it apply to the states, and why this case was a good vehicle for that, better than that case. And, and he was just a good lawyer. So tying that back to the law clerks, yeah, he was very secure in, in who he was and that the law clerks would perform for him regardless of what their thinking was because because he knew you know he knew what he was doing I mean he was an incredibly smart capable guy and uh, I don't know if you uh, you've uh, calculated this but certainly of the uh, many opinions he's written a good majority of them are still are still good law today I don't know if it if that contrasts with those uh, those genius colleagues of his or not but uh, um, in light of that, let me ask you: What are what would you say are the uh, one or two most important, most significant opinions still still valid? One would, would assume today that you think were his were the justices most, and what do you think he would think? Well, I'd, I have to say his answer would be: It's like asking me to choose among my children. I can't do that. Um, although every time he said that, he would then choose. Um, Ironically, I mean, I, you know, he he went back and forth. I think between Baker versus Carr and Goldberg versus Kelly. Baker versus Carr is the opinion that that basically said the Supreme Court and the federal courts will examine uh, the drawing of legislative lines. Up to that point, it had been thought that. Uh, if, if the way state legislative districts and congressional districts were framed by a state legislature was totally disproportionate and diluted people's votes, that wasn't the federal court's business. That was, up, that was politics left to the states. So Baker versus Carr said no longer this is depriving people of, of their ability to vote and that's a constitutional issue for us to consider. It opened the door to reapportionment of the legislatures of the entire country um, and and to the one person one vote concept which came right after it uh, that that basically transformed democracy in our in our country um, so he he what Brennan would say is that Earl Warren believed that to be the most important opinion after Brown versus Board of Education of the Warren Court and that Earl Warren credited Brennan for it. I would certainly put it on a list of most important opinions. Brennan's other choice, Goldberg versus Kelly, was the one that basically said when the government offers you a benefit, when, when, when by law uh, you are entitled to food stamps or welfare or Medicaid or Medicare or some other government program, once you meet that entitlement standard, you have an entitlement and the government can't take that away from you without affording you due process, the right to, to have your say and, and explain your circumstances and hear the reasons why you're being denied. And, and so he, he was both pleased and somewhat surprised, I think, at, at the kind of due process, the, the civil due process revolution that Goldberg versus Kelly brought about. I think you have to add his First Amendment 
cases to that list and maybe even put it at the top of the list. The, the, the combination of New York Times against Sullivan and, and the flag burning case, Texas versus Johnson, gives us an imagery of what free speech really means and why it needs to include offensive speech um, why it needs to include speech that you might rather not have to hear because you can't in any principled way draw a line that that will prohibit the proper speech and allow the proper speech and he understood that I think in a way that nobody ever has not not even Douglas not even black not Holmes not the the great First Amendment justices I think Brennan really got that and the importance of that. And so that to me maybe is, is b very much at the top of the list of what his legacy, and, and I you know, that legacy is at the heart of what the Supreme Court is still wrestling with in First Amendment terms. I mean, the, this military funerals protests case that the Supreme Court is hearing is precisely about that set of issues. So. So Brennan's free speech decision making is still right smack in the middle of what we're doing in the Supreme Court. No question about that. Uh, well, let me let me close by asking you: uh, given the timing of this, we are even probably more in the midst. Uh, certainly, with the uh, Justice Brennan was was uh, at the center of debate uh, uh, over over sort of what does the how is the Constitution interpreted. Uh, his view of a living constitution versus the uh, so-called originalism on the other side, uh, now obviously represented most uh, clearly on the court by Justice Scalia. Given the timing of this book, uh, do you think this, uh, how do you think this, uh, uh, or what do you think this will offer that debate? Will it uh, provide new sustenance? There's, uh, there's certainly been shying away from the term living constitution, even from liberals. Where, do, where does this fit in? Well, and Brennan didn't really use the term living constitution that much, but, but I hope that the book revives and energizes the, the, the piece of the spectrum that is sort of disappearing from the debate, which is that the constitution couldn't have meant to be a fixed document, that, that, that nobody could have thought that these general terms like equal protection and due process would would be set in their meaning um, in in 1868 or in in 1789 and 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 never change and never adopt to the circumstances in which society found itself and so that was really I think at the core of his view that 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 these were majestic terms that were meant by their authors, by the framers in, uh, of the original Bill of Rights and of the 14th Amendment, um, to be used to, to deal with the necessities of different eras and different generations, and that it was illogical to think that they could have some kind of meaning that was set in stone at the moment that they were written. And, and I think that point of view is not so clearly articulated anymore and 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 to the extent it is it gets trashed by by lots of people and so I think having that point of view back in the debate I hope is is vitally important great thank you very much good luck with the book thank you